Welcome to Five Strike Weekly. This week we go into the time machine and wonder what would have happened if Atlanta United kept Yamil Assad. We also update you on the news highlights from around the world of football and pick our quarantine house. All that and more coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ and this is Tanner and Mark. Before we get into it, become a member of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button or hop over from Facebook and subscribe. This segment is sponsored by Thinking Man Tavern, a cozy Decatur neighborhood pub. Grab a tasty beverage from a wide variety of selections and a plate of something delicious from the menu. To go, check out Thinking Man Tavern. Hope you all have been staying safe and sane and getting some exercise. In case you missed some of the news and fun things that have happened, let's get into the news. So, <laughs> Joseph Martinez, Speaking of fun things and Orlando City, he did a Q&A on Atlanta United Twitter and he answered on why he loves playing Orlando City. He said, because they're my kids. And oh my God, you know, it's just the, you know, the, the legend of Jose Martinez just grows and grows after, uh, you know, him saying this, they're replaying the Orlando City match uh, tonight on ACLUTD.com slash live. I mean, uh, unfortunately, we're also filming at the same time, so we're not able to watch it. But, oh my god, this is that match that I want to rewatch over and over. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the funny thing about Joseph is it's just like, he knows exactly what to say to make sure Orlando fans hate him forever. Like, if you're an Orlando City fan, you hate Joseph Martinez. You have to, right? Like, you have to. I would despise it. Like, if there was a Manchester City fan or a Manchester City player that was like, or a Tottenham player, an Arsenal player, or whoever it is, like a rival or a Liverpool player, God forbid. Like, if Mo Salah was like, why do I like playing Manchester United? Because they're my kids. I'd be like, yeah, you can go and do one, mate. <laughs> yeah, no, Joseph uh, never misses an opportunity to remind Orlando City who they are and their place. But no, it's uh, it's just Joseph being Joseph, like the, the banter. Like, did you see his exchange with uh, JEU? Where he was like, who's your favorite DJ? <laughs> Joseph yep. responds, you, babe. <laughs> <laughs> it's so lovely. Yeah. yeah. He, uh, you know, and also, of course, uh, he's pissing off uh, other Atlanta sports fans as well. I uh, rehashed a, uh, a quote of his, one of his legendary quotes uh, saying that Atlanta is the only that wins shit and so much salt in the comments there. Holy crap. I mean, just... Hawks fans, Falcons fans, Braves fans, they, uh, I don't, I don't think they get it. You know, it's like basically right now there is only one team in Atlanta that is really winning things. What, what's the argument? Like, I don't even understand. <laughs> it's like, just, and that, that's the problem too. I think, yeah, there's a lot of transplants and you, so you guys aren't really fans of the other Atlanta sports sure. per se. Yeah, and yeah. so. You know, well, I think for us, we're able to look at it more objectively and like, be, right. you know, without being fans of those teams. I know, Mark, you're a fan of, I think, the D.C. sports teams mostly. Right. Actually, I, I think all of them. And I feel really bad for you for like two of them because they're terrible. Um, the Redskins <laughs> and the Wizards. Um, but but uh, I think for hey, me, you, you had know, Michael just... Jordan for like a small amount of time. <laughs> That's the reason why I root for the Wizards, actually. But no, please continue your voice. Uh, you want to talk about your fandom as a, as a Redskins fan? Because you can no, probably, I like, don't. get I... in the same boat as Orlando City fans, but they just I hate their I officially vibes. have disassociated that team from my uh, profile and life in general. I don't follow them, so... Uh, yeah, I'm no longer an R Skins fan. I even refuse to say the name because it's just that terrible. But it's anyway, so, yeah. No, but I mean, I think it's just weird because you look at it and I mean, since what, 95, the Braves haven't won, the Hawks haven't won in, you know, really recent memory. I mean, maybe back in the 60s or something. I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. I know they got close and had a decent team, you know, for a few years, especially when Dominique Wilkins was here, but like, the Falcons have lost two Super Bowls, so like you haven't won, and Atlanta is doing it right now, and they're doing it in an entertaining fashion, and they're bringing a lot of life to the city where before sports did nothing but drain the soul of the city. At least that's what it sounded like. See, like yeah, I, no, go ahead, man. You know, yeah, like I think what I don't get, it's like like Atlanta United's on the same, I guess, level, so to speak. They don't have like an unfair advantage against their competition. They're just a better run team. And then most other teams in MLS. And I would think that Atlanta fans of all fans would appreciate that. You know what I mean? Like, 
why would you denigrate the one team that quote unquote actually wins shit? Like, I don't care. You know what I mean? Like, if you're not a fan of the sport, that's one thing. But the sport is not inferior to other, you know, sports. So, like, again, what is their argument? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's bizarre, and uh, you know, it's probably convoluted. So we won't get into it too hard. But uh, but speaking of Jose Martinez, let's move on. Uh, also on Twitter, he uh, is uniting with uh, a um, a T-shirt type of uh, thing that is pretty bringing awareness to washing your hands. Uh, he said, quote, ATL lets unite for our neighbors in need. Get your Wash for ATL t-shirt and support the Greater Atlanta COVID-19 Response and Recovery Fund. And go to washforatl.square.site for more. And yeah, we'll have it in the description box below so you can help in, uh, kind of support that cause. And uh, Arthur Blank is also involved again after uh, a 5.4 million uh, pretty much last month that he uh, donated to the relief of uh, COVID-19. He extended another COVID-19 relief effort to Game Day Associates, shits rather, through a $1 million fund uh, for the Mercedes-Benz Game Day workers. That's great to see. I mean, just uh, I know Mark. Mar- Mark, your uh, your roommate used to work for. Uh, you know, at, at least at the stadium at one point. And that's probably something like where, I mean, that's huge because a lot of that is very seasonal slash uh, very event-based. And, you know, for him to extend that out, that's got to be massive, right? Yeah, pretty much, exactly. So she uh, she did work there one time, and then I don't think she had took any more shifts at the yep. end. But, uh, uh, but, I mean, yeah, it is that sort of thing where there are people who are banking on those games and events happening at the bends to pay their bills and so you know it's like what do those people do now you know file for unemployment look for other some type of work oh while wow, a lot of other places are letting people go as well it's a tough time so i think uh i think it's a great um gesture from arthur blank and i just feel like in this time like sports teams need to act like members of the community because they are you know and they are you know a lot of sports teams have a very I guess you could say favorable agreement with their community where they're able to make a lot of money. So I think giving back is just the right thing to do. So I, I applaud this 100% from Arthur Dwight. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, so Major League Soccer, they extended their team training moratorium. And yeah, I mean, this is no surprise whatsoever. Uh, yeah, April 24th is the date. Uh, I mean, arguably it should be probably extended even further, but I, you know, they're just going to maybe keep extending it until they, uh, when, you know, the time comes, they realize things are really going to be able to change until we can flatten this curve. Um, yeah. Also, uh, Darren Ear, Darren Eels, he told The Athletic that, uh, this is kind of a more, uh, kind of lighter topic for sure. He said, uh. His favorite part of his job is to tweet out the code name of each player when they are signed for Atlanta United. So, for instance, a, a wasp and a horse for Donington Nagby, uh, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's done so many now, but that was definitely the first one. Right. Um, yeah, it's almost openly trolling the fans now at this point, just right. how difficult they are sometimes but uh, he said quote i'm not saying we would do that but i'd almost sign a flare just for the best cryptic tweet and i wouldn't put it past darren eels not at all um yeah. it is interesting how that came about though the fact that they do have to have code names for these players you know going about their business yeah no it makes sense because i mean you know uh when he was on uh tottenham and in their front office and when he was uh, making the the deal for you know Gareth Bale and that type of stuff. I mean, sure they probably couldn't just say Gareth Bale all the time. I mean, people would be like, um, yeah, you know, are you guys selling him? What's happening here? Um, so it makes complete sense that they would do that. Um, he also said later on in the article uh, on the Athletic that. Uh, they basically, um, they are not looking for, uh, you know, it's very unlikely that they would use their DP spot on an older player in the future. And that, yeah, goes right in line with what uh, the ethos is of the club. So I think, you know, anyone that's still, uh, you know, always is 
like excited with a Radamel Falcao is linked with uh, LA United, they should probably temper that excitement very, very quickly. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the old guys who can't run anymore, so you're not going to find any complaints from me on this one. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't exactly lead to the exciting football that we want to see, yeah. per se. So, right. uh, But anyway, uh, in terms of MLS and what the GMs are thinking about during the league suspension, the Athletic with uh, Paul Tenorio and Sam Stechgall also talked about uh, a numerous amount of things, but I think notably that the transfer markets, um, you know, in MLS might not be as affected as, say, the rest of the world and definitely in Europe, where some really large transfer fees are bandied about all the time. It might be much more suppressed this time because, well, obviously the demand and the amount of teams maybe able to buy is going to be a lot less. Uh, maybe some other teams are looking to sell a lot more, but the amount of money that the you know, maybe able to throw around is going to be a lot less. But in terms of MLS, it's going to be probably still, I think, business as usual almost because uh, the owners, you know, they are in a salary structure league. And so they don't have to spend as much. And many of them are billionaires. And so what it was saying is, uh, as one high ranking source put it, the strength of the league has always been the financial strength of its owners. And so, uh, you know, in terms of the impact, in terms of the transfer market, uh, it might not really be that big for MLS in terms of, you know, what we will, uh, you know, be forced to do or anything like that. But uh, maybe we will, you know, if we have to play a protracted season or a condensed schedule, uh, we might have to play a lot more young players. And that really, uh, I think it will stretch the, the probably uh, product quality on the pitch but other than that i mean not a surprise really right i mean i think the one thing you have to say is that as far as incoming players go i think it changes that you know it doesn't change the game too much for for mls i think as far as players outgoing i think it affects clubs like atlanta united because now you have to wonder what is the evaluation going to be for a player like ezekiel barco where you know the team you know i think multiple times and they kind of figured they wanted in the region of 30 million you know dollars for the player you might not see that anymore, especially not this summer with clubs losing so much money from not, you know, playing matches and not having the opportunity to make the revenues they're used to. But also, you know, moving forward into January 2021, assuming he stays through that point in time, I mean, will you be able to still get the fee that you want for him that sets the bar? Because I think Atlanta would want to break the, 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 the record again for the highest fee received for a player. And if the money is, you know, if the market's depressed, which if we're being honest, I think the market does need to be depressed because the numbers were ridiculous. You know, the numbers have gotten completely silly in the last five, six, seven years. But I think, you know, again, for, for a team like Atlanta United, it does affect what you have to value your players at. And does that mean Ezekiel Barco leaves for a lower amount or does that mean he stays even longer depending on his performances? Because how can you really measure a player if you're playing a condensed season and he doesn't get to show off his wares in the Olympics as well? So those are big things that would have affected his valuation. And does that change his future with Atlanta United and how long he stays in Atlanta now? Yeah, uh, that yeah, that's a great point on Ezekiel Barco, but maybe for PT Martinez, uh, the urgency and maybe you know us taking a loss might be something that actually happens. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I mean, like, uh, I mean, this summer it just seems more and more unlikely that uh, it's going to be a normal summer. It's going to be business as usual. I think FIFA have more or less said that they're open to you know adjusting the transfer market as need be. I know they're already going to be flexible with the contracts that end on June thirtieth. You know, uh, they've already announced that pretty much each league uh you know that player will have will be obligated to that team until their league is wrapped up and and so um yeah i think uh if atlanta and i were looking to sell barco or pt this year that's obviously affected um i don't know i just it's, it just feels like everything gets in terms of that specifically it feels like maybe gets pushed back a year that seems like the only thing that makes sense because i think that we'll still be dealing with the ramifications of this in january and I think teams in Europe particularly will be still feeling the ramifications financially. And so, you know, in terms of how much business can be done in January, I'm skeptical of that as well. I think if anything, Atlanta United is going to have to delay their plan, so to speak, for a year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, let's move on. And uh, Atlanta United wingback Brooks Lennon is, uh, according to MLSsoccer.com, the 10th best crosser from open play in MLS. 
with a 29.41% success rate. That's combining stats from 2019 and 2020. And for those of you wondering, Julian Gressel does not make the top 10 at all. Very interesting stats indeed. Uh, and I think it, it kind of go, goes in line a little bit with what I think the, uh, the hearsay was for Lennon as well, that he was a good crosser from open play to begin with. But Julian Gressel, does that surprise you guys? Maybe. I mean, sometimes I think it also benefits you again when you have a forward like Joseph Martinez. Um, you know, you can get away with maybe not having the best of crosses. But for me, it always seemed like he was a decent crosser of the ball just whenever you see it. But again, maybe that's because of the number of good balls that go in for Joseph that he scores off of. And those are the ones that are memorable and the ones that aren't as good are less memorable. Um, I also have to say that I think that maybe it kind of falls in line with, you know, Atlanta doing their sabermetric type work on, 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 you know, whether or not they keep Gressel and looking at those smaller numbers. And yes, you know, goals and assists are big, but, you know, they've figured out that they're smaller, more important, you know, statistics that sometimes add up to having a better player, especially in terms of what the cost is. And maybe that combined with some other statistics, they looked and saw, hey, he's not worth the money that he wants and we can get a player who's more efficient for a lot less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, Julian Gressel not being in the top 10, it's not a total shock because uh, it was only 30 crosses, I think, attempted it from open play that qualified you for this list. And so uh, my guess is that Gressel just has a lot more than that. You know what I mean? Like he's playing wing back. He was looking for often looking for Joseph. So um, there were some games in 2019 where maybe we crossed more than we wanted to. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily surprise me in terms of Brooks Lennon. I mean, for me, it was always about him building chemistry with Joseph. You know, I never thought that, um, I never, I've never thought he was a bad player by any stretch, you know, and I think, I think he can, you know, provide that service. Uh, yeah, just, he just needs to play with Joseph more. So, yeah. And yeah, so far it's only been what, five games. So it's <laughs> right. Yeah, not, not a ton. Right. Uh, so moving on from that, Emerson Hyndman, uh, he's showing off his freestyle techers. And uh, wow, I mean, it was quite good. I mean, <laughs> you know, you have a little bit of around the world and then an opposite foot. You have uh, it bounce on the side of his foot to start off the whole kind of slew of tricks. I mean, who knew he had this in his locker? <laughs> I don't know. I've always kind of rated him technically, so it doesn't shock me. I think a lot of players, especially once you get to a higher level, if they put in the time and put in the effort, they're just their touch and their control is fantastic. And when they're just dribbling around, for them, it's just kind of like it's like you know, if someone's a really good piano player, it only takes them a little bit to figure out how to play a new song when they start doing it. And for someone who's playing a game at such a high level and so comfortable with the ball. It probably only takes them five, ten minutes to figure out how to do something new where if it was us, we'd be there for a whole damn week before we could even possibly even figure it out. And even then, we probably couldn't do it. Yeah. But there is a thing where, yeah, I mean, Darlington Nagby with uh, one of his, like, famous MLS goal of the year uh, type of uh, where he's juggling tricks. And he even said that he's not a guy that actually does and can do a lot of freestyle tricks in keepy uh, It's It's interesting. I mean, so for me... You know, not every player, even if they're a really, really technical player, can have, uh, you know, freestyle techers. And yeah, I mean, I think that's super surprising. But uh, I, I think what's not surprising is that he's challenged his fellow Atlanta United teammates in Brooks Lennon, Adams, uh, you know, Lawrence Wyke, Jake Mulraney. And none of them have responded yet with a video. <laughs> because how do you follow that? That was pretty damn right. good by Heinemann. So it's like, right. uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, in terms of that, uh, yeah, Jake Mulraney had uh, almost a, a first touch test, almost if uh, during the quarantine. Yes. It seems like he's lost a little bit of his first touch a little bit, unfortunately. <laughs> oh. Uh, albeit it is from a ball that's being launched from a an apartment window right and then he's having to you know first touch it on the street it's a little bit harder to uh to do it i would probably think but uh but mo adam i mean it looked pretty good two touches he kind of lost it a little bit after that but uh yeah i mean you know who hasn't tried to throw it up and see what kind of uh touch you would get but uh, obviously, from another, like from a trajectory of a window, a little bit different, a little bit a little hard, especially when you have not trained for however long it's been. It's about, uh, what a month? So right. yeah, not not too much shame in that for Mulraney and Adams. Um, so moving on from that, uh, MLS, they are uh, apparently 
According to a report, they're cutting full-time employees' employees' salaries up to 25%, uh, and that's kind of the more New York-based uh, type of employees uh, due to the COVID-19, of course. And then uh, some of the kind of higher ups, uh, they're they are the ones that are taking the 25% reduction of pay, like Don Garber and top deputies like uh, Mark Abbott, Gary Stevenson, but. Uh, yeah, they're, uh, the, the people in the New York uh, office are not taking as much of one, but it still is it's a sign of the times. I mean, pretty much yeah. it's a difficult time, especially for New York as well. I mean, especially how maybe expensive it is to live there. Uh, yeah, they, you know, some of the lower guys have not seen a reduction in pay, and that's good to see because, yeah. wow, I mean, it, imagine if, uh, yeah. You yeah. have all this going on, and you're making like you know fifty thousand or something like that, and then you know you have to take a pay cut, and you're living in New York. Ooh, right. Right. super super hard. Um, it's just yeah, it's a sign of the times. It's really really sad and difficult. But um, one kind of uh, reduction in pay that we want, like that's good to see, and that we uh, you know have seen uh, just announced today was that the Premier League players. Uh, they have announced that they are voluntarily uh, kind of taking a reduction in pay to help the NHS and its charities. That's really, really awesome. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously they're a, that, they're a league that's really well paid, for sure, right. uh, in terms of their players. And so uh, their initiative is called Players Together. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, I think, you know, the distribution of funds... Uh, to these, um, you know, these co- coronavirus, uh, you know, kind of relief things, absolutely necessary from yeah. these people that are, yeah, I mean, really high earners, and I think if uh, more of the world could do that, that would be a fantastic thing. But well, like yeah, a- <laughs> no, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, like again, hats off to the players. Um, I wish uh, a few more of the owners in that particular league, the Premier League, you know, took a little more of a lead on that. But, uh, you know, because the, the owners themselves were actually like kind of in a disagreement with the players. And so but I think the players have uh, have done well then. And, you know, depends on what club we're talking about, too. Because some clubs, some clubs have not covered themselves in glory. I know for like Liverpool, you have, we're going to originally go with the plan to furlough staff. Right. Um, and then use the government assistant program to pay them. But then they rolled that back after the criticism they received because, well, when you make over 540 million pounds in profit, it's kind of hard to see why you need to lay off your employees. I think Tottenham actually might yeah. be only one of the few clubs that are actually doing it. Right. And for the three of us... Are we really surprised Tottenham's <laughs> doing that? Are we really surprised Tottenham's going to do that? Come on. But I mean, yeah, it's good to see that some of the players are doing it. I know Jordan Henderson's been been leading the way with a lot of this, and a lot of the individual players have made a lot of donations. I know Sadio Mane has made donations back home in Senegal. I know that Andy Robertson uh, kept food banks stocked back home in Scotland. Uh, Marcus Rashford's doing a lot as well. So yeah, there's a lot of players from each team that are really stepping up, and it's good to see that they're really taking the initiative to help people in their, in, in the in the communities that are around them because yes they're paid well and, and they're lucky to have that job but they work hard for that job as well so i think some of the attempts that have been made to vilify these players is also kind of i think a bit wrong because a lot of them you know unless your name's kyle walker are doing the right thing yes <laughs> or jose Mourinho, but uh, yeah <laughs> but we won't get into any of those two yeah kyle walker a story not rated for this show <laughs> <laughs> see what i did there uh... see what i did there <laughs> I just can't believe but, in these times, Kyle. Really? Yeah. Oh, dear. And if you if you don't know what's going on, basically Google it. <laughs> yeah, just Google it. Because the he- the headline just- the headline from like was it the Sun or the Daily Mail? I hate both of those papers. But when you read the headline, you're just like, oh, for f- sake! Like, come on. Oh, they had on. to go. They had to go at him for sure. Speaking That's, uh, of speaking of players, <laughs> like really effing up. Uh, how about that Russian player who broke quarantine? to spend to be with his girlfriend for her 18th birthday this player is way above 18 by the way like oh mm, god dude yeah i mean belarusian premier league still playing last time i checked so like maybe it's just like a that side of the world thing <laughs> who knows uh we're not gonna speak on the entire country uh though and so i'm sure there I mean, are good people i'll, I'll, I'll slate <laughs> um 
Speaking of players doing dumb things and getting out of them, AJ. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so Ronaldinho, uh, when he, for whatever reason, in Paraguay, had a fake passport. Uh, yeah, he's been in uh, jail for the past 30 days, essentially, or 32 days, if we want to be really, really specific. Uh, he played some pickup games while in jail. Now he's finally has been, uh, he's uh, posted bail. That's 1.2 million euro. Uh, and he finally now has been moved to house arrest in Paraguay, uh, where he now cannot leave the, t the country. But uh, yeah, really kind of um, a sad but weird and kind of like interesting story to kind of follow in this weird time uh, has been Ronaldinho legend, uh, you know, definitely one of the, my idols for sure. And freaking, I mean, what is he doing? But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just kind of almost a little hilarious. I mean, who's advising him? Who's, you know, who's, who are his people? I mean, just... Right. I, I doubt that, I mean, he even really even has 1.2 million euros at this point. I, I don't know. I, I Not kind of doubt. Exactly. I kind of doubt that it actually came from him. He might, this is me speculating, he might owe some people money for getting him out of jail. Just, mm. yeah, he and his brother. But anyway, um, just really, yeah, just... Uh, I think a sign of the times as well, I think we'll say, but um, <laughs> anyway, so let's move to a more happy topic in that Andres Iniesta, and I believe it's girl, I guess, uh, they are doing the Oh Na 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 dance, uh, and actually quite well here, uh, just a little, maybe the sound is, uh, the sync is off, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, not really surprised Iniesta has this kind of footwork, right? Nah, it seems pretty on brand for a guy who's been as silky as he has to, to be able to have the, uh, we'll call it the agility to be able to do a dance like that. Right. Exactly. And especially, yeah, I mean, you know, definitely he's a slightly older guy. He's not 40 older. yet. He's fine. <laughs> I feel he like him in MLS. Yeah, exactly. And, but, you know, I think maybe he, he gets a little bit flat because he looks a little older than he is because of the, you know, just bald head and yeah. So, but, um, anyway, so. Uh, moving on from that, some social distancing done right. Thomas Muller of Bayern Munich, he uh, has had a contract extension now, uh, and it was announced in this perfect photo where, yes, that's exactly how we should be doing it nowadays. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, the fact that he even is getting a contract extension right now in this time. Curious, but I mean, you know, for a club legend for them like right. that, it kind of makes sense as well. Yeah, that's what I thought of really. Like, he's been there a long time now. Indeed. Yeah, he's just a better Jesse Lingard, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's an inside joke, and I don't know if we should really get into it. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, that does it for the news for this week and gets us to buy or sell. And simply, we put up an Alien United topic, and we say if we buy or sell it and give our reasons why. First topic is that, or first and only topic, Atlanta United has better jerseys than the Atlanta Falcons, who just announced their uh, new jerseys today. We are filming this on a Wednesday. Uh, I think it got leaked, so they unfortunately just had to put it out anyway, and it's not even on sale until next week, apparently. But uh, buy or sell, the Atlanta United has better jerseys than the Atlanta Falcons. Tanner. Uh, I'm biased. I'm gonna buy it. I mean, the Falcons have some decent jerseys, but this is also the first time they've changed them in like what 17 years. I mean, right. could you imagine having the same two soccer jerseys for 17 years? Right. That would be absolutely crazy. But I mean, I'm biased. I'm gonna say Atlanta United, so I buy that Atlanta has better jerseys. But honestly, also, are we shocked they leak? Are the Falcons like maybe the Falcons are new to this because again, first jersey release in 17 years, yeah. like. They get leaked. It happens. They, they were forced to reveal them today because they got leaked yesterday. So they're like, well, we may as well show them because everyone's seen them now. And it's just like, this is the soccer world in a nutshell. It just happens yeah. every single day. But they're just like, we don't care. We'll show them later anyway because you guys have to wait. Right. That's true. <laughs> Mark? Yeah, uh, I'm going to buy as well. I think uh, if you're comparing directly, I prefer our stripes to their gradients. Um, I prefer our white and gold to their whites uh the all white look i think is pretty decent i don't love the 
there was like a white top red pants combo. I didn't love that one. Um, I think they're all black is probably their best look, but uh, I'm still taking a lane United all the way. Yeah, and uh, I mean, but, uh, it was compared, I think, in a meme to uh, Adam Sandler's. Uh, what is it? <laughs> that was the Panthers. Uh, the Panthers. The Carolina did that. Panthers did that. Yeah, that was the and Panthers' so, official account. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's. I mean, I'm not a Falcons fan. I'm not really a American football fan, so it's really one of those things. I'm gonna take Atlanta United all day. Bye. But it is. Uh, they look better. The announcement video wasn't bad. I, I liked it. I mean, it was. Uh, I got slightly hyped at like, you know, 7.30 a.m. when I saw it and I was like, okay, yeah, cool, all right. Uh, they have some new kits now or uh, jerseys and it's like, okay, great. But at the end of the day, yeah, Atlanta United, I mean, yeah, ours are, I think overall on a whole is just much better. Uh, but yeah, I have, you know, I think, you know, said in the past or at least, you know, right before we started recording was that, yeah, uh, it is difficult if it's like years that's a long time to wait obviously i think you know i think fans buy a lot more of the players jerseys to kind of buy that time uh i'm sure a lot of uh falcons fans had you know maybe big jerseys that they're maybe not so proud of anymore uh and maybe yeah definitely ryan and jones but uh for me like it's hard to keep up uh, a lot of times i mean even with la united how many kits that come out but even for, you know, Arsenal kits, I've definitely wanted all three in a year before. Difficult to, you know, keep up with that. So maybe there is a little bit of balance to be struck. But there's so much money in it that it's probably never going to happen for uh, MLS nor uh, the other teams abroad. But uh, anyway, like that about... does it. Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. No, what, real quick. One thing I like about the soccer system is that, like, you associate a kit with a certain year, especially if it's a special year. Like, anytime I look at uh, highlights from, cha from Chelsea's Champions League run, I'm like, oh, that jersey. I would so buy that jersey today. So it's like, it's a little bit of like a memorabilia thing as well. Yeah. Yeah. I you, think the one thing. Exactly when. I think the one thing Atlanta added fans would say, though, is they would take the all black look. Because I think a lot of Atlanta added fans want an all black, like, third kit alternate. So that's something that you can kind of look at the Falcons and be a bit jealous of, is having that. That all black look, but then again, it just—I don't want an all black look for Atlanta United because it's just LAFC. So like, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, now just... that they've come into the league, yeah, it's it definitely is a little too reminiscent of it. But be, definitely before they actually did, yeah, I think we were all pining for it. We all wanted it. But anyway, that does it for buy or sell and gets us to a new uh, topic just for this week. Anyway, it, it's called quarantine house, and uh, you'll see this graphic up on the screen right now. It's pretty much pick your quarantine house. House number one has Miggy, has Goose, has LGP, Nagby. House number two has Tito, has Parky, Remetti, Garza. House number three has Gresselmania, has PT, has Assad, and has Escobar. House number four has Joseph, Barco, Miram, and Larry. Which homes or which home are you going with, Mark? Oh, putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, so house number one gives me strong dad vibes, right? Um, <laughs> I think a lot of responsible eating, going to bed at a reasonable time. Um, I think for me, I'm going to house number two. Like, I just imagine, like, chips and FIFA and Mountain Dew and <laughs> probably some beer as well. Especially with Remedi. Yeah, Remedi, like, absolutely is getting trashed. Now, I'm house number two for me. <laughs> I love it. Tanner? Uh, for me, I think it's an easy one. I think it's got to be house number four. Just because having had the pleasure to, to, to be in the room uh, when uh, Kelly Francis got to interview Justin Miram last year, that guy's hilarious. Jeff Lerman has that dry, witty sense of humor as well. And so they're going back and forth. And you know Joseph is going to be chipping in as well. I think Barco's the kind of wild card. What Barco do you get? You know, if he's being a bit loose. He's got a full sleeve tattoo now, so maybe he's a bit of a wild man. But for me, in my sense of humor, Justin Miram, Jeff Lerman, and then Joseph as well, I think that'd be the banter right there would be great. Maybe not as much FIFA and beer and you can chill but you know you'd have cigars and rum so I think it'd still be a pretty good time yeah no speaking of wildcard I mean yeah you pretty much you're saying Barco might be a wildcard I think the whole house number four are wild they <laughs> you don't know you know kind of side of each of these guys you're gonna get I mean Larry I think famously during the uh the parade the MLS Cup parade I mean, just kind of wild out. Uh, he was asking for beer from the fans off of the bus and, and was consuming it 
you know, right in the middle of the street. Uh, you have Miram, who, I mean, I'm sure we all know is, uh, yeah, definitely, probably uh, a little bit crazy, but definitely a great guy. And he's you know, just got uh, a dry, witty sense of humor. Like he's just, con it's just constant, just little, just jabs that he just says completely deadpan. And I love, I love that shit. That's the kind of humor that I love. So it's just, yeah, he's a funny guy. Whenever we, we got to interview him, um, he was just making fun of Jeff Lorero when it was the whole time. So just those two going back at each other because he's the one that tweeted the photo of Jeff reading the newspaper. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's just like I feel like those two would just be funny, and again, just Joseph just pitching in. I, I think it'd be funny as hell for me. What about you, AJ? Yeah, so I think uh, I mean I'm torn between house number one and number four. Uh, I think house number one has this superlative for me, and that LGP with the asadors and you know, adas and just I mean all that. I think it would be I think uh, for someone that's a foodie and someone that just loves freaking eating uh would be difficult to pass also uh miggy's wife looks like she's a pretty good chef as well so i would just i think double on top of that i mean there's a lot of food here that uh i can't say no to house number four just looks like the you know a blast an absolute blast it's tough i think it's house number one for me because the food absolute during this quarantine wins above all i can pass out happy each night just having, uh, you know, just the, the Asador alone would be just golden for me. So uh, so uh, we'll move on from that. That was a, a good bit of fun. And uh, now is another bit of fun. It's now to our reverse pass segment. And essentially this week on reverse pass, we wonder what if Yamil Assad never left Atlanta United? And uh, this alternate scenario ponders if Atlanta had the resources to have him on the roster. So it kind of absolves any of those kind of roster building uh, kind of obstacles that would get in our way here. But uh, just alone in terms of that, I mean, the first question would be because it really became a point of uh, at least positionally, you know, Yamil Assad versus if, you know, Ezekiel Barco, would he have come? Uh, because, yeah, Assad essentially more or less saw the writing on the wall and he left because he knew that his playing time would have been depressed slash he would have maybe had to come off of the bench. And so, yeah, would an Ezekiel Barco have come if Yamil Assad had stayed? I mean, for me, I think it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation because Yamil Assad had the flexibility and it's, could you have... Would you have found a different formation with Emil Assad? You know, would you have played a three-five-two with Emil Assad as a wing back? You know, to fit a Barco into the team. But also, then again, that 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 leaves you with the question of what happens to Tito. And it's just like in MLS, you don't have the luxury of being able to have that good of depth across your team on the bench. You know, if you were able to have that type of depth and you had the number of matches where it was like, look, every player is going to get at least 25 to 30 matches because of how we're going to rotate, how we're going to substitute. Then yes, but for me, you know. I think it'd be really hard to see Ezekiel Barco coming if he's not going to be starting. And in this situation, you're assuming you're keeping Emil Assad because you want him to play significant minutes. And unless you would have been playing him at left wing back, I struggle to see how him and Barco would have fit into the same team. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the player I think about potentially uh, you know, having a different uh, destiny, I think, is Tito because... That's the off season, if I remember correctly, that Tito was bought down where so from a definitely player to a TAM player. And um, and I mean after twenty seventeen Tito saw his role reduced, you know. And so um, you know, if Assad had stayed, would that would he have been the one whose role was reduced? You know, would Tito have remained uh, a significant player as well as uh, remaining, you know, if he had kept his DP status, you know. Um, and so I think, yeah, 20, how 2018 plays out, um, that would be interesting. I think that we probably have about the same chance, I think, of winning the supporter shield. Maybe a little more consistency just because, uh, you know, Barco was in and out of the team, especially, of course, after the incident. Um, and so I think uh, we might have been a little more consistent in 2018. And I mean, like, People forget, you know, well, I don't think people forget, but we were right there in terms of the record, in terms of the shield, you know, there I can still remember the, the amount of results that um, really didn't go our way that could have, you know, if we had just picked up a few more points, we're talking about a uh, historic season, you know, 
Whereas, you know, it was still pretty good, but, you know, it obviously is a different level. So I think that's, for me, is probably the big thing is that 2018 probably plays out differently. And then after that, um, I don't know, I think, I think it always would have been tough for us not to stay here long term. You know, especially yeah. when you see the type of players that Elaine and I have gone after, I think that Assad would have been uh, a candidate to be sold just because of, you know, his wages and his profile to a degree. I mean, like, he's still in the league because other teams certainly value him, DC in particular, so. Yeah. And because, yeah, definitely Yamil Assad, yeah, he's a guy that worked hard going backwards and forwards. Um, yeah, and was still a guy that uh, I think brought, I think, you know, with the stats alone, you know, seven goals, 13 assists in that one year for Atlanta United. Uh, yeah, brought a lot of, uh, you know, at least uh, in the assist department for sure, in the passing department, and uh, just kind of creativity department for Atlanta United. Uh, and pitched in, you know, quite amount of goals for someone out on the wing. So, uh, you know, it is where, I mean, if he was played at a different position, if he was played at wing back, um, it really probably his role wouldn't have changed really too drastically. But if he had maybe mo moved centrally or something, uh, maybe instead of, uh, you know, a Darlington Nagby uh, being brought on uh, later on, maybe he fills that type of slightly that role uh, as a box to box. Maybe that would have been um a di you know a different thing and uh you know but uh definitely i think yeah in 2018 our depth would have been a lot a lot stronger uh definitely for the supporter shield for sure um because yeah i mean i think you you would see that he would be able to fill in probably across uh the line and also in midfield um so it's one of those things where assad um yeah if he was on the team um you know just the difference in kind of everything in uh, the weaknesses I think we had maybe in 2018 where, uh, you know, we had a couple guys that just, you know, definitely helped our bench and kind of beefed it up a little bit, but he would have been almost a different element that would have kept us more secure at times um, and definitely would have been willing to take more shots than maybe when Ezekiel Barco was still kind of growing into himself. Um, but I think one of the other questions would be uh, later that year, would Atlanta United still have won the MLS Cup? If, uh, yeah, you know, if we won Supporters' Shield, would we have still been as motivated? Because uh, I think a lot of the players have talked about, kind of posthumously, uh, Greg Garza, Parkey even, that's when we lost the Supporters' Shield, uh, definitely against Toronto in that 4-1 drubbing, I, I forget, I think it was 4-1, but um, yeah, they essentially kind of used that as a real big motivating factor. And they knew that, yeah, once they got past Red Bulls, that, yeah, they had every chance to win MLS Cup, but uh, that they almost felt like it was destiny. But uh, would it have been different if we, uh, you know, had a, a stronger depth, you know, to at the last day uh, be able to, you know, to cover that? I mean, it would have, I think we might have even seen. Uh, instead of Chris McCann, it would have been maybe a Yamil Assad uh, playing as a wing back or a left back, maybe per, per se, to, you know, because he has played at the left side. Maybe Barco would have come in. We would have been very, very solid. Now, maybe the defensive, uh, you know, aspects of it may not have been as strong, but I think, uh, you know, an attacking minded uh, lineup for Tata Martino was probably always in the cards. So, you know, it's a, it's a very kind of uh, think scenario that, uh, you know, we've, um, you know, we're kind of, uh, I guess, just, what's the word? We're uh, entertaining at the moment, but uh, also would uh, P.T. Martinez would have come if Yami Hosta was still here as well. I mean, because then, you know, I think it's also Miguel Miron, you know, always was going to go. He was always going to be sold, but... Uh, if we have a kind of, you know, not ready-made replacement, but just someone already in the house to be able to maybe cover that position, maybe a PT wouldn't have come. Well, I mean, if, you, if you're looking at it and, and you assume that uh, Yamil Asad would have been able to build off his 2017 campaign going into 2018, if you have another season like that or possibly even more productive than his 2017, then, you know, it's it would be hard to kind of rationalize spending the type of money you spend, even though admittedly the, the quality of a PT Martinez is is 
better than an, yes. uh, the Emil Assad. But if you can save that money, still get the same production, maybe not have the sell-on benefit, you know, sell-on benefit of, of a PT Martinez potentially. But you know, I, I think that, that with the Emil Assad, if, if you have the numbers, then you can invest that money somewhere else in the pitch. But that's a central midfielder. I don't think you would have given him DP money, but I think as a TAM player producing at that level, you know, you either a trade him away within the league for a lot of money if he wants, you know, that DP money. See Julian Gressel. Um, well, I get TAM money, but he, you know what I mean. Um, you know, and as far as playing as a left wing back, I think you get to play left wing back. Maybe not left back fully, but I think you would have seen more left wing back in. I mean, would you rather have had him at left wing back or, you know, or McCann? I mean, I think you take him to all day, every day in that scenario. Um, I think Atlanta still would have had a very good chance on MLS Cup because you got to think that have they won supporter shield? Yes, you might likely lose that first, like, at, you know, away to Red Bull, but you're bringing home a chance to go to the, the MLS Cup in front of your fans. You still would have been hosting MLS Cup. You still would have had the same scenario, you know, playing in NYCFC. <laughs> so... You know, I still think that Atlanta United would have, you know, winning breeds winning. And I think that having one supporter shield, they would have wanted to still go on and win MLS Cup <laughs> as well, because I think a manager like Tata Martino would have put the pressure on them to continue to perform. So, you know, yeah, it's one of those weird things where he's a player that definitely has his qualities. And I was interested to see what he would have done this season, you know, playing a full season with DC United and seeing how he produced. Um, clearly, he was an important player for them. But, you know, I think he's one of those players that, you suffer if, to have an MLS because he's got that great quality that you'd love to have him on your team if you can, but giving him the playing time he needs and paying him what he what you what he would require under the the league structure, it makes it difficult to keep this type of players. But you know, if it's a bit more open, then you know you're able to compete with you know the teams in Liga Mekis. That's the type of quality you have to have in terms of depth off the bench where you can rotate and you're still bringing in a player of of Emil Assad's quality even if you're rotating your squad. Yeah, because yeah, he when he was with us, he was only making one hundred fifty thousand dollars when he was on loan with us, uh, and so yeah, that's where it is uh, in terms of Assad. Uh, he definitely fit in the first year very cheaply for us and produced at a definitely way over his salary for sure. Uh, yeah, I think you know his demands probably would have increased, uh, and then yeah, something would have happened to where we had to sell him. Uh, but, um, you know, then maybe you don't even see the emergence maybe of, uh, you know, a Julian Gressel on the wings as well, uh, because yeah, I mean, his spot might have been come into question as well, uh, because I think if you look at just maybe raw numbers, they comp, uh, they are pretty comparable, but I think, you know, Gressel really came around definitely in 2018 and 2019 when he was played at the wingback position. So uh, in terms of that, uh, you know, all in all, would it have been beneficial if Yamil Saad had stayed? Mark? Um, oh man, it's, it's difficult, I think, um, to see that scenario playing out smoothly, especially given what uh, you just said about Gressel's uh, emergence, because I think from early on, Gressel established himself as a favorite for Tata. Um, and I think you remember him in an interview with, I want to say Tilo Tomo, who basically said like Gressel's one of the first things he picks after Joseph, and it's, you know, because of his consistency and the qualities that he brings versus the other players. Um, and then, yeah, just like how the 2018 season played out, um, I think there's to a degree where uh, if uh, Red Bulls host that first leg, it's, it's more interesting. So uh, I don't know if that benefits us necessarily, but um, yeah, I think I think it played out the way it had to. And I think the fact that uh, in consecutive seasons, Elena has gone and gotten uh, the players at the level of Ezekiel Barco and P.P. Martinez, you know, maybe they haven't lit it up, but I think just for uh, a player outside of MLS coming in, those are certainly two of the biggest in league history. And so uh, I think that, yeah, Atlanta has been pretty consistent with uh, buying players and also letting players go. And so I think that it was beneficial in the end uh, for what the club is trying to do and the direction they're trying to go. Dinner. Yeah, I tend to agree with him on that. I think given the situation and given the structures that are in place, it's unfortunate that you have to lose a player like that. You know, if you're playing, you know, 45 to 50 matches a season, then everyone's going to get their matches. But in MLS, you, you might play, what, 40 to 45 if you go far in Champions League. Um, well, actually, I guess you could get to 
50 maybe if you go far in Champions League, U.S. Open Cup, and you go all the way to MLS Cup Final. But that is a lot of matches. But unfortunately, the salary restrictions don't allow you to be able to have players like that. Um, and if you aren't able to rotate and aren't able to afford to do that, then I think it, it was the right decision to make because otherwise you would have blocked progress. And we talked about it earlier, Ezekiel Barco is a player with a large sell-on potential. And, and you know, Yamil Assad is not. And if you can buy a player and then sell him for twice his value, you know, between 25 and $30 million, that's what you know a really good soccer club that's going to change the game and change the way that the league functions is going to operate. Keeping a player like Emil Assad, not necessarily because it's not as progressive in terms of, you know, you have a player who's really good and you keep them around. Yes, that might be statistically better for your team and you might have performance more consistent, you know, more performance, consi- uh, consistent performances, excuse me. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I don't think is possible in MLS. I think the club made the right decision, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm not one of those uh, Emil Assad, like, piners, definitely not. But uh, I think, yeah, if, uh, you know, we didn't have any uh, any sort of roster restrictions, he would have been, I think, a beneficial part of our team for sure. I think he, like I said earlier, would fill in a lot of the other positions and allow us to really almost kind of not have a drop off when one of our top players goes down. Uh, it would have been really, really handy. Uh, yes, the reality of it is, is that we have roster restrictions and a salary cap. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of, you know, what we want to do, how ambitious this club is, it is absolutely to uh, make waves, not only in MLS, but around the world. Uh, we've seen that with a Miguel Amiron uh, sale to Newcastle United. I mean, it's uh, we've kind of proven that the model can work to a degree. Now, if we can do it time and time again, uh, that's going to remain to be seen. Obviously, the COVID-19 uh, kind of pandemic across the world is definitely affecting uh, maybe our ability to maybe do that. But uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it's definitely, I agree, uh, the best thing for Atlanta United, unfortunately, was to uh, lose a, a great player like Yamil Assad, who was very, very productive, but uh, just did not fit within the um, you know roster building that year and that offseason. So... Uh, even though we uh, apparently wanted him to stay and he uh, maybe wanted to stay, but he, yeah, saw the writing on the wall. So, uh, but anyway, that does it for Reverse Pass. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, let us know in the comments below if you guys uh, like to see that type of stuff and we'll do more of that in the future. But uh, next segment is now Mailbag. You guys send in these questions through IG Story. Please continue to do so and we might get your question in the future. First question comes from Akshabayaga. Uh, they ask, uh, best European team Atlanta United could beat? Uh, what do you guys think, uh, Tanner? Um, I think if you're being completely reasonable and honest with yourself, I think that people might be a bit more familiar with, with English football, um, English soccer, than they are with maybe some other leagues. Um, I think that Atlanta United has the quality of a very solid, maybe not very solid, but a mid-table or so championship team. Um, I think you have to really look at the quality of the players all across the board, the spending restrictions that are put in place. If Atlanta United was allowed to spend and be as ambitious as they wanted to and, and pay the wages that they wanted to pay, then I think you would have a team that could compete, you know, at whatever level that Arthur Blank wanted them to compete at. But realistically, I think you're looking at a team that, that has the quality to, to, to beat other teams in the championship and maybe on a one-off, you'd beat a lower level Premier League side. But I think people also have to recognize and understand, you know, in a friendly setting, you know, it's different from a competitive setting also, but how good the players are, even on, you know, a poor team in the Premier League, the quality, the pace, the level that they're paid is so much higher and they justify that pay because of their performances throughout their career. So even if it's a player, you know, a team like Aston Villa or Norwich, who are, you know, in the relegation zone or flirting with it, definitely Norwich is going down this season. The quality of those players is still far and above what your average major league soccer player or even your Atlanta United player. Now, mind you, you have really good players that stand out. When he was here, Don Tanagby is a player who is fantastic. Joseph Martinez obviously has quality and I think he could score in the Premier League now. Um, you know, PT Martinez is a high quality player, Ezekiel Barco. But when you move back into the defense and look at some of the other players, Miles Robinson might get there one day. But if you look at everything, the quality is just not there compared to a lot of those teams in Europe. Mark, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to make sure I heard Tanner correctly. He said mid table championship team. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I would say, yeah, uh, 
MLS is probably most comparable to championship, although I still think like, you know, I don't like I don't think most MLS teams would get out of the championship. But uh, I think a lot of MLS teams would be League One teams looking at you. Oh, exactly. Well, the case in point, like uh, uh, what's his Antoine Walks, you know, he comes over from Portsmouth uh, currently in League One, and he's uh, I mean he's played a lot for us because of injury, but I think he's primarily a depth piece, and so I think that's kind of a good gauge maybe of of comparing the qualities. Yeah, I think Atlanta United is probably uh, a mid-table championship team. Yeah, I mean it's it's one of those uh, we're a little bit top heavy for sure. I mean definitely all in all is what uh, the consensus is. Um, yeah, we just don't have the salary structure to really fill the coffers to really make us just uh, be able to compete with you know the likes of uh, a Premier League team. Um, yeah, so on a good day, yeah, definitely somewhere somewhere in the championship we could maybe be one of those teams, but. Um, next question comes from Hector LH6. Uh, he asks, how do you, or how do you think this p pandemic will affect the overall transfer market? Uh, we kind of touched a little bit on it in terms of, uh, in the news, but I think real quick, uh, you know, will we be able to, uh, you know, sell an Ezekiel Barco, um, you know, in the next year? Like, what do you guys think? Mark, what do you think, man? I mean, I think I kind of already spotted my my bit on that earlier in the show. Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think Atlanta United makes any major sales until next summer. I think if anything, uh, this winter is an opportunity for uh, any MLS owners in general who you know want to pony up some money because some teams are going to be hurting. You know, some some non MLS teams are going to be hurting. So I think, uh, yeah, if anything, you might see some business there. But other than that, I think it's going to be quiet for the next year. Yeah, I mean, there's so many like transfer rumors always kind of uh, paired along with a club Arsenal uh, that yes, uh, it's yeah that it's a lot of it hard to believe because uh, in this time I don't think any team is really going to be spending more than like even uh, 100 million for any player at this moment because I think it's just how are they going to be able to justify it as well as uh, you know maybe even for. Uh, Arsenal fans in terms of how expensive the seats are and their season tickets. I mean, yeah, they're going to be uh, quite a bit ways of mad, I think, for sure, uh, if players are being sold at that type of rate. So, uh, yeah, the overall... It also comes down to, the, to, the, to the, what FIFA does because there's been a rumor, well, not FIFA, UEFA. There's been a rumor that UEFA might suspend financial fair play because there's no way to accurately reflect and judge the accounts of many of these teams. And if you're a team that has a billionaire owner who doesn't give a shit about money, see Man City, see currently Everton. I mean, Manchester United are always going to be in a place to spend because of their business structure. I mean, Liverpool, not as much, but they also have a really strong business. Chelsea, depending on what Abramovich wants to do. I mean, these bigger clubs, Clubs, if there's a suspension of financial fair play, I think you could also see these clubs just going and spending whatever they want to because they know that they can get away with it. So, you know, it, it depends on what the club is and what rules end up changing. Because if you see something like FFP get put on hold for a year just so that clubs have a fair shake, because a lot of them are probably going to make more losses this year than they've ever made, you know, in recent modern soccer, that could affect things as well. So it really might depend on, you know, if something like that happens, because something like that happens, then maybe, yeah, you might get a bit more from Ezekiel Barco from a source you didn't anticipate because you have a free spending owner who's not going to get, you know, a Man City type punishment for, for breaking financial fair play. So last question comes from Aval G. Aval G asks, will Gressel ever join Atlanta United again? We'll go with uh, Mark first. Mark. <laughs> um, I think, okay. For, actually, I don't. The one, the one scenario I could see him uh, returning is if like he continues to improve over the next couple of years, and like for some reason he's available, you know, because like for this, I think he's getting paid about seven hundred thousand right now, and so uh, you know it's a pretty solid salary. I think there's still an opportunity where he could outplay that number to a degree. Uh, and so I could see like any night being interested, but I think he's probably just gonna end up playing for like three or four different teams over the course of his career. Tanner? Nah, he's never playing for Atlanta United again. I think that there's too much bad blood there with how that went down and it seemed that there was too many issues with the contract negotiations and, and a bit of, of of bad blood between I think possibly both sides for for how everything was handled, whether or not 
East Side's in the right or wrong. I think there's a little bit on both sides, but with how things were left and some of the things he said, uh, I don't think he'll come back. And um, might sound harsh, but personally, I, I don't want him back either. Um, I, I didn't like the way that he handled his exit. And for me personally, uh, I think that, you know, the way that you talk about the club when you're trying to negotiate a contract is really important. And it felt like some of the things he said were um, more about him than it was about the team, even given the, you know, the understanding of there being issues with him getting paid a certain amount. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I don't think he'll yeah. come back and yeah, I don't want him back. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, some of his comments definitely were divisive for sure for many. Uh, but also, I mean, he, you know, when he left, he said that be happy that it happened and that, um, you know, I think that's a, a great point in a sense. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we are uh, happy that he was a huge, uh, massive piece in us winning, you know, three titles uh, during the past three years. And so definitely, uh, you know, his time with us was, you know, filled with glory and uh, it was happy times in terms of on the pitch. Uh, definitely, yeah, a little bit uh, in the at least uh, interviews in and around his contract talk definitely has not been fantastic. But he's also kind of near an age where it's like, okay, so 26, and if he uh, did, I think, sign a four year contract, then if he does come back to us uh, when he's around 30, if that even is the case, I'm not even sure that LA United, you know, would really want to do that unless he comes in at a Kind of more, uh, you know, secondary role if he comes off of the bench or something like that. Uh, maybe I could see it happening like that. But uh, and that would be maybe a homecoming that uh, you know time has passed. Time does heal a lot of wounds. So you know maybe kind of uh, later on it may happen. But anyway, that does it for the mailbag and pretty much the entire show except for the question of the day. And this week's question is that uh, we're going to get on Twitch and live stream some so maybe some watch alongs some gaming or even just hanging out uh, you know just chatting with people uh, what would you like to see from us that we do uh, let us know in the comments below we are looking forward to hearing what you have to say so anyway guys that's it for us today thank you all again to the hospital workers the people stocking up groceries delivering food picking up the trash all those keeping our infrastructure in place. You guys are the heroes and stay safe, everyone. We love you all very much. Thank you for watching and getting through all of this with us for Tanner and I'm AJ. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Yeah.